Um, also, good news this morning, according to U.S. News & World Report, uh, we're the sociology department at Berkeley is the top sociology department in the country. And, uh, for the first time ever. We've been tied for number one before, but it's the first time ever. It's not the first time we've been ranked number one, but it's the first time U.S. News & World Report caught on, you know? It's the first time they caught on. So, so good for them. They've been doing their homework. They've been studying. And, and good, you know, good for them, you know? Yeah. Yes. We are not tied with anybody. We have in the past been tied with Wisconsin. Um, I know. I'm aware of their work, but that's, uh, you know, I don't, yeah. Uh, yeah, Wisconsin's got a great sociology department traditionally. They have a huge sociology department, like 50 plus faculty or something, like almost twice the size of ours. And yet we pass them. Ha! 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 And, uh, and our stepsisters to the west, they, they're fifth, tied for fifth, with like 10 other schools I'm, I haven't heard of. So. Uh, yeah, so good for us. All right. So to maintain the wonderful tradition of Berkeley sociology, uh, today we'll return to the topic of the lecture from Tuesday, which is uh, behavioral mimicry. Uh, and why are we talking about this? Because we're in a part of the class where we talk about automaticity or uh, non-conscious bases and non-conscious factors uh, which direct behavior in, and attitudes in everyday life. And so naturally we come to behavioral mimicry because we think that behavioral mimicry is a process that largely goes on outside of awareness and is a product of non-conscious factors. Remember that as we were talking about, oh geez, what's going on now? Um, as we were, I don't want to have to do this all day. Okay, aha, ha, okay. As we were talking about uh, behavioral mimicry, one thing we were talking about is that John Barge and company have argued that it is an example of the perception behavior link. Now, the first time we talked about the perception behavior link was in the Barge, Chen, and Burroughs 1996 paper, wherein the perception behavior link was cited as the mechanism, or really the name for the tendency for some sort of stimulus to affect your behavior when it's simply presented uh, within your perception. So when you're reminded of the stereotype of the elderly because you're working on a scrambled sentence task that has words related to the stereotype of the elderly, then you walk slower. Perception, behavior are linked. Uh, likewise, when you're shown images, subliminally shown images of uh, an African-American face, you'll react in a more hostile way in this research because of the stereotypic associations in our culture between African-Americans and hostility. Again, perception influences behavior outside of your awareness. So Chartrand and Barge in 1999 wanted to extend this finding, this idea of perception behavior, the perception be behavior link, to the domain of nonverbal behavior and specifically to behavioral mimicry. So what they did, well, we already went over this, but they showed that participants would mimic another interaction partner who's actually a confederate with, in league with the experimenters. They would mimic that confederates nonverbal behavior, including face rubbing and foot shaking and smiling. Sounds like an Elvis Presley song or something like that. Okay. So, and I think it's important, I don't know if I emphasize this sufficiently, but they would ask these participants after the study, did you realize that the other person was rubbing their face and then you tended to rub your face? And the participants were like, no, and I, I don't know why you're suggesting that. I thought we could trust one another. Why are you, why are you saying that? You know? so, uh, they literally said exactly that. They all said that. So, uh, no, but seriously, what they said was, no, I had no idea that I was mimicking somebody's behavior. I was unaware. I didn't even really notice that they were uh, touching their face, shaking their foot, or smiling. Maybe they noticed they were smiling, whatever. Um, now, why did they ask this question? Why is this an important question to ask? Why did they ask the participants afterwards, did you realize you were doing this? Yes. Exactly. If they did this consciously on purpose, then it wouldn't be an example of automaticity. It would not be a non-conscious process. So, for example, it could be that in interaction, people imitate one another's behavior totally on purpose, totally consciously. You know, maybe they pick up behaviors, they go, oh, that's a cool behavior, I'm going to start doing that, because that's awesome, you know? Maybe they do that. Maybe uh, they do it as a conscious strategy uh, to con convey flattery or uh, some kind of positive feelings towards the other person in a way to butter them up and make uh, interactions go better. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe they, uh, they say, oh, that person's shaking their foot. I'm going to purposefully shake my foot because imitation is the highest form of flattery and then they'll like me more. Now, these are not likely things, right? We don't think that people do consciously imitate and mimic one another. We don't think that's the typical thing. But 
you know, you, they, they need to eliminate that as an alternative explanation. And so they did by asking people, did you realize you were doing this? And they were like, get the hell out of here. I have no idea what you're talking about. So, so that's how they established reasonably well that this is a non-conscious process. Then we talked briefly about this study that was done in the Netherlands showing that when servers repeat back to customers their order word for word, you gotta do it word for word to make it happen as well as possible, then they would be tipped at a higher rate. This is further evidence for the idea that mimicry, behavioral mimicry, or in this case, linguistic mimicry, can increase liking for the mimicker or liking of the mimicker. And this brought us naturally to a question of, you know, what's the extent of this effect? Are all behaviors mimicked? Or are there some behaviors maybe which aren't mimicked? Uh, are there some behaviors that elicit their opposites when they're, when they're done? Now, now, what am I talking about? Well, Tiedens and Fregal in 2003, they had this hunch that there's certain kinds of nonverbal behaviors that don't tend towards mimicry and similarity and conformity. That there isn't this tendency for people to enact the same behavior, but maybe for certain kinds of nonverbal behaviors, ones that are associated with hierarchy, status, power, dominance, there's a sort of natural tendency to take the complementary role, to take the opposite non take on the opposite nonverbal behavior. And I was talking about uh, a variety of nonverbal behaviors that have been shown to be associated with hierarchy and dominance in non-human animals as well as uh, humans. So, for example, the, you know, where I come from in the South, there's this big difference between seeing somebody on the street and going like that, give them a little, give them a little bit of a chin thrust there, give them one of those. I see you, yeah, I see that, okay. <laughs> you too, all of you back there. And uh, there's a big difference between that and going like that which is just submission, just like it's over, I, I've lost, you win, you know, don't, please don't hurt me. That's, where I come from, that's what that means. Uh, and you gotta be careful going around going like that, because somebody might do that back to you, and then two chin thrusters, and bad things can happen, you know? <laughs> Some really bad stuff can happen. Uh, so, Tiedens and Fergal were like, okay, well maybe for these dominance-related behaviors, where there's clearly one behavior that's the more dominant uh, position or, or, you know, whatever, uh, or, or nonverbal behavior, that there's a tendency for the other person to then take the less dominant one, the more submissive position. And so, here's how they tested this idea. Uh, what they did was they had participants, again, work with a confederate on a painting description task. Remember, Barge and uh, Chartrand worked on a photo description task. This is a very similar task. They're describing paintings now. And what they did was they had you, say you're a participant in the study, you would interact with a confederate, and the confederate was trained to assume one of two different postures. Uh, one of the postures, or sorry, one of three different postures. One was an expansive posture, uh, so arm over the arm of the other chair, or maybe both chairs, your legs crossed with ankle over knee, so... Um, what else is it? Da -da -da -da. Right. So, uh, in this condition, you would be like you'd be like this, you know, and you'd be like really spread out, expansive, or the confederate would be like that, and you'd be confronted with that, and you'd be terrified. You'd be very, very intimidated. Um, another one would be constrictive, and my body doesn't even do this naturally, you know. But you'd be like slouched, constricted like this. This is not natural for me. I, I never do this. So, um, and then in the third condition, you would be in a neutral position. Uh, yeah, where, you're, where you sit straight up, your arms are on, uh, yeah, and your legs are a bit apart, so just kind of normal, the way, you know, most people would sit, I guess, like that. Not intimidating, but also not a submissive position either. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I'm kind of thinking, wow, that expansive position is not that intimidating, right? You know, it's not, just looks kind of slouchy. I don't know. I don't, I don't necessarily think that it would intimidate me or cue some kind of dominance role or anything like that. Uh, the constrictive one, I kind of get that, but... In any event, past research indicates that expansive body postures are associated with dominance across species. So, you know, what happens when two animals come in, you know, come into contact and they're scared of each other or they're thinking about fighting one another, you know, hair stands on end, they, you know, they get up on the tops of their toes, you know, they try and get their heads higher, this is kind of the logic behind the chin thrusting. Uh, some kinds of animals will expand the feathers or limbs in order to take on as big of a shape or a size as possible and essentially try to say, I'm huge, don't mess with me. Um, likewise, uh, if an animal is trying to signal to the other animal that uh, there's no conflict here, I'm not gonna try and fight you, they try to get down, you know, like dogs will do that where they put their, uh, their paws forward and try and hug the ground and get lower and kind of say, look, there's no conflict here, calm the hell down. <laughs> so, 
the results. Uh, so participants are confronted with a confederate that's either in this very expansive position or this very constricted one, and then they're interested, or, or the neutral one, and they're interested in, while they do this painting uh, task, how big of a, of a position will the participants adopt? How will their posture be affected by the person that they're working with? And so the way that they test this is, they video can you two stop talking? The two of you there, can you please stop talking? Thanks. The way that they did this is they videotaped the participant uh, adopting whatever posture they want in response to the confederate, and then uh, they took a measure every minute with a ruler. So then they play it on a video screen, and they, they use a ruler to measure how expansive is the subject. So again, you're confronted with either the expansive person, the constrictive person. This is still very intimidating, I mind, mind you, because I'm doing this. And then, uh, and then the neutral, like that. And then you, supposedly, are changing your posture, and then it's videotaped, and then they take like a ruler on a monitor and go, OK, every minute, how, how expanded or constricted are you? And what do you think their predictions are? Or what do you think their basic idea here is, what their, what their hunch is, what their prediction is? Yes. Right, that you'll tend to do the opposite. So if you're presented with the, the expansive body posture, you'll tend to constrict. If you're presented with the constricted body posture, you'll tend to expand. And then neutral will just be neutral, somewhere in the middle. It won't really influence you. Um, so one thing they did, before the Confederate even walked in, they checked and made sure, do people have the same, across these three conditions, they have, on average, the same degree of postural you know, expansiveness, um, which is a word I did not know about until I read this paper, postural expansiveness. And people did have about the same amount of constriction versus expansion uh, before being presented with the Confederate. But then, when being presented with the Confederate, participants who worked with the expansive Confederate tended to adopt a more constricted posture, Participants who were exposed to the more constricted postures tended to make, adopt a more expansive body posture, and then, um, and then the, uh, being presented with a neutral body posture was somewhere in between. I, I don't remember exactly. I remember they didn't get any gender interaction effects, that it didn't differ by gender, but I don't remember exactly how they studied that. Um, so I, I'm not positive. But if you email me, I can send you the paper, and you can check it out. So, uh, so one thing to take from this is these are fun you know, things to know to play sly tricks on people you interact with. Uh, so the mimicry one. I told you, like, or I don't know if I told you this, but after we read the mimicry paper, after it came out when I was in graduate school and we all read it in this seminar, we all became like hyper aware of this tendency to mimic other people's behaviors. And we'd be talking in the hallways, and we'd like cross our arms, and the other one cross our arms, and we'd be like, no, I'm not going to cross my arms, you know? <laughs> because you don't want to be, you know, you don't want to be subject to these social influences, right? You know, like you're a social psychologist, you're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to come up with the principles, not fall prey to them. So, um, and besides, we all want to be unique, right? We all want to somehow be above this and not do cognitive dissonance reduction or conformity or obedience to authority or what have you. We all want to be unpredictable outside of the, the, the scope of these theories somehow. Um, but likewise, the complementarity one is fun. I actually had a student from this class last year who was like, uh, who tested the complementarity thing on like all of her professors in their office hours, like went to their office hours and tried to adopt like expansive <laughs> body postures and reported back. I don't know how she, she didn't really, you know, it wasn't, you know, systematically recorded data, but she said that there was this tendency for them to constrict, you know, and hide under their desks in terror. Um, <laughs> So I would never, ever, of course, advise uh, such, such conduct, but uh, you might have a little bit of fun with this. You might, might test it out, see how far it goes. Also, um, greater complementarity. The greater the extent to which the subjects in the study conformed to predictions, the more it was the case that they constricted in the presence of an expansive confederate or expanded in the presence of a constricted confederate, the more this was the case, the more participants rated the Confederate as likable and the interaction as comfortable. And so Tiedens and Fergal took from this that it's the case that when you have complementary body postures, people tend to like one another and feel comfortable with one another as a result. But are there any other possible explanations for this, for this finding, this finding that uh, the more complementarity, the more they tended to um, then like and uh, um, and feel comfortable with the other person. Maybe, maybe, that's interesting, maybe. 
I was looking for something else, but that's interesting. Yes. Nope, they didn't. Uh, they probably should have. <laughs> okay, well, as an experimentalist, one thing that I think of when I see this, when I see them making the claim that the more you tend to adopt the complementary body posture, they, okay, so, so you're being presented with one or another kind of body posture. Then you tend to adopt the complementary one, and then you also report around the same time on a survey that you like the person and that you feel comfortable with them. And they're claiming that A led to B led to C, okay? They're claiming that the body posture you're presented with directed your adoption of body posture, and the more you did that, the more you felt comfortable and liked them. But a critic who's savvy to experiments might say, could say, maybe what happens is the more you like them and feel comfortable with them, the more you tend to adopt the complementary body posture. That they've got the causality wrong here. It's not the case that the comfort and the liking comes after the complementarity, it causes the complementarity. And so when you're presented with a certain kind of body posture and you like and feel comfortable with them, then you'll tend to adopt the complementary one, but you wouldn't otherwise. Um, so they designed a second study to get at this question because they're experimentalists and they're very worried about these kinds of things. Some people wouldn't be there, this kind of thing keeps social psychologists up at night. Okay. Ah. Uh, yeah, okay, if this whole process is supposed to be non-conscious, how is it that you can consciously report, how does it report, con uh, sorry, how does it influence conscious feelings of liking and, um, and comfort? Well, I think it's the case that these people don't know why they feel you know, greater liking and comfort than these other subjects in this other condition. They just report it. And then we're inferring that the difference, because everything seems to be controlled in this study, that the difference is that, they, uh, that there was complementarity here and not complementarity there. Or that the higher the complementarity, the more they tend to report that. And so in a way, it's a lot like an automaticity process where something that is consciously done, like rating of liking or you know, walking or something, you're aware you're walking, but you're not aware of the influence on the speed of your walking. Um, so, Okay, so. Like I was saying, there's this causal direction problem of, is it the case that the comfort and liking comes after the complementarity, or it causes the complementarity? And these people wanted to be savvy to this. So what you'd want to do, ideally, is somehow experimentally create high or low complementarity, and then see uh, you know, how much liking and comfort results. The problem they had with their first design with this is they let the subjects do complementarity and then ask them how much liking and comfort they felt, and so they don't know, maybe the liking and comfort came first. Uh, but if you could experimentally induce it, if we could somehow randomly assign you to be in a behaviorally complementary position with a confederate or not, and you don't have any choice in the matter, then we could ask you if you, you, know, if you have higher liking or comfort, and we'd know really strongly, yes, the complementarity creates liking and comfort. Just the same logic of experimentation we've been using all along. If you could randomly assign people to medicine, complementarity, or the placebo, non-complementarity, then you could see the effect on the dependent variable, liking and comfort in this case. Is this clear? Okay, so now they're gonna do an experiment where they try to create complementarity. But now, how do you do this, right? Like how do you experimentally make the subject's body posture be the same or the opposite from the confederates? I mean, they can try and influence the subject, but they need to be getting it right every time here. They need a strong manipulation where every single subject they know is perfectly complementary or perfectly non-complementary. They need to be manipulating their behavior, or their, yeah, their body posture. How the heck do you just directly manipulate somebody's body posture? You can't just walk in and say, okay, now I want you to put your arm like this and put your leg like this, and you don't mind, do you? Okay, great, you know? That'd be very strange. That'd be very, very strange. So what they did, was they told participants, we're gonna attach you to a galvanic skin response machine. Uh, does anybody know what a GSR, galvanic skin response machine is? It's a measure of, among other things, uh, uh, your skin conductance. It's used in lie detectors. You, uh, what it does is it passes electric signals across your hand and measures how quickly those electric signals go back and forth, uh, how uh, conductive your skin is. And when you lie, you tend to sweat a little bit, just a tiny little bit, because you feel uncomfortable. And that tiny bit, which you can't see visually, you can see it under a microscope, but you can't see it normally, but you can detect it by sending electric signals across the skin, and they'll conduct faster when your skin is wetter. 
And that's, that's one of the key things they use in a lie detector. And so they basically hooked them up to a lie detector, full thing, right? Blood pressure, heart rate measure with the clip on the finger, uh, galvanic skin response on the hand. And they tell them, in one condition, they tell them, you know, you need to keep your arms elevated and your legs in this posture for the galvanic skin res response machine to work. That's like a precondition for it to work. Or in the other condition, they say you have to cross your legs like, you know, like this, and then, and then you know, put your body like this. And in that way, the blood pressure measure works better, or something like that. They gave them this bogus story about how we can't, these physiological measures won't work unless you adopt exactly this posture or exactly this posture. Okay, so this is, they found a way to convince subjects 100% of the time to either be in the constricted or expansive position. Uh, very, very clever, I would argue. Um, by the way, if you're interested in galvanic skin response at the Exploratorium in San Francisco, that awesome uh, kids museum, which I would never go to without a child, um, <laughs> Uh, they have a galvanic skin response machine, and like the back left, they have some really cool psychology type stuff, and it's just a simple one where you just put your finger, it's essentially galvanic skin response, it's not, it doesn't use electricity, you just put your finger under a microscope, and then they say, think of like some embarrassing thing that happened to you, or a time you lied, or got in a lot of trouble, or something, and then you can see little tiny beads of sweat come out of the pores of your finger. It's totally awesome. Um, <laughs> it's really, really awesome. It's hard to do a little bit, though. You've got to kind of think of something really embarrassing. All right. I'm not telling you what I thought of. Uh, so they arranged this. So now they make, they make a four-condition study. Okay? The four conditions are this. They either they attach you to all these crazy machines and then probably don't even turn them on. Um, and uh, they make you adopt the constrictive or the expansive position. And then you're presented with a confederate that you interact with who also is randomly assigned to be constricted or expansive. So they've created four conditions. Expansive with expansive, constricted with constricted, expansive with constricted, and constricted with expansive. And their prediction is that when it's complementary, expansive, expansive with constricted, constricted with expansive, when they're complementary, they'll be more liking. But, you know, the subjects will say, oh, I like that person. I like that interaction more. When, it's, when they're not complementary, when they're the same, expansive with expansive, constricted with constricted, they'll be less liking. There'll be less comfort in the interaction. Um, and that's what they found. They found that the complement, complementarity tended to lead to liking uh, when experimentally induced. Uh, it's a great finding. And one of those results is kind of weird, right? Like, for some reason, you actually feel more comfortable when you have the constricted position and they have the expansive one. When you're in the submissive position and they're in the dominant one, you actually feel more liking even though you're adopting the submissive position. So that's like a strong test of their claim, right? Because you wouldn't normally think taking on this submissive position, this low power, low dominance position would be comfortable or generate positive feelings or liking. You wouldn't really think that normally. But it did. It did in this case. And, and so it's a strong, claim, a strong test of their claims about complementarity. Like even complementarity that disadvantages you, you'd even prefer that, and you would. Any questions about this? Yes. No, I think they like didn't even turn the machines on. I think they just, uh, or maybe they turned them on but didn't like record anything. It's actually very expensive to use these machines. Uh, and uh, they may not even have known how to. They were kind of just a cover story for getting their bodies into a certain position. Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to reread the paper. Yeah, yeah. You can email me. I'll send you the paper. They didn't test that. They didn't test that, so I don't know. I don't know uh, to what extent that would carry over to future interactions or somehow imprint a sort of hierarchy. Um, it, stand to, it stands to reason that sufficient exposure in a certain position would lead you to take on another position or another, you know, a different conception of the standing between yourself and the other person. It stands to reason, but I, they didn't test it. Yeah. I, one thing that interests me is like, what about people who are dispositionally high in dominance? There's this thing called social dominance orientation that people vary in. And I wonder if you know, people who are high in dominance, whether they're really more comfortable in the submissive position when confronted with a dominant person. I would think they'd be like very frustrated, maybe very stressed out, uh, maybe very threatened. I wouldn't think they would like it much. Uh, but nonetheless, for this research, you know, they, they, found, they found good effects. Yes? The mean ratings of liking were like almost identical in the two complementary and the two non-complementary situations. So, 
Um, yeah, people felt about the same level. I think they just reported liking for this one, for the, for the participant, and maybe the interaction itself. And it was about the same when you were submissive with dominant as dominant with submissive. It was about the same. And then it was always lower when it was dominant with dominant and submissive with submissive. Yes? Oh, trying to like get out of the kind of arranged position? I don't know. I mean, they said that people, you know, adopted the position that they told them to, but that would be interesting to try to pick up like subtle deviations from it if people were sort of like, I know I'm supposed to do this, but I really want to constrict because this person's intimidating me or something. Uh, I don't think they really tested for that. I think they felt like that the manipulation had worked pretty well and they pretty much stuck to where they set them, but it would be very interesting if there were like subtle, subtle shifts like that. Yeah. Terrific question. Okay, so I would say that the answer, and the answer is one of the conclusions from this lecture, I would say the answer is for certain kinds of behaviors, uh, people tend to mimic one another. For certain kinds of nonverbal behaviors, people tend to mimic. And the greater that mimicry, the more liking, comfort, cohesion emerges in that interaction amongst the, those people. Uh, the more you might identify with the person and so on, feel similar to them and like them. But for certain kinds of behaviors, that tend towards hierarchy, where we have associations of hierarchy, mimicry is not normal. Instead, differentiation and complementarity is what's normal. We feel uncomfortable when we mimic on hierarchical, hierarchically oriented uh, behaviors like chin thrusts and uh, expansive body postures. It doesn't feel natural, it doesn't feel good, you don't tend to mimic. And likewise, when you have complement, complement, uh, eh, complementarity in those, in those kinds of situations, then you tend to get higher liking and cohesion because those are associated with hierarchy and therefore differentiation. And it's the differentiation and hierarchy that makes you feel comfortable. And you feel like the flow of interaction, the fluidity, the ex expectation of hierarchy and differentiation is somehow violated when the people do mimic. So they tend not to and it tends to not make people feel good. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, yes. like across cultures. They have, I don't know if they've done all this across cultures. Uh, I know that they haven't done the expansive constricted body posture across cultures. Uh, and it's a good question. To what extent is this culturally universal? Because given that similar patterns are found in non-human animals, you might think all of this is a sort of basic biological process that, uh, that humans have by nature. Uh, but until you show that something like these effects are robust across cultures, you know, you, you would have a limited confidence in that claim. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Yeah. I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, <clears throat> so the question is, are these people the same age? Because maybe that interacts in some way with the dominant submission, uh, dominant submission uh, kind of thing. Uh, these people were roughly the same age. They controlled age in the typical way they do in these studies, like 18 to 22 year old. Or maybe they were MBA students. They might have been MBA students because they teach in a business school. So they might have been like, you know, like 24 to 30 year olds on, you know, roughly, roughly. Um, uh, so they did control age. How would that interact? I don't know. I don't know. I think a lot of information, a lot of things that cue dominance or high status, like age, education, diffuse status characteristics, gender, all those things, uh, being in a power position, like being a boss versus a subordinate, all those things might interact in interesting ways with this. Like, the most intuitive thing I would think of is that when you have these uh, high power, high status characteristics, maybe you're older, you're a boss, and all that stuff, and you're interacting with a subordinate, that maybe the complementarity tendency is even stronger, and it even more cues liking and fluidity of interaction and deviations from it are considered even, they're even less common and, cons and disrupt interaction even more. And I think that'd be a very interesting place to go. Knowing Laura Tiedens, I would kind of have thought that she would have tried to do that. So well, I'll ask her, she's over at that other university. So, which I, I have stepped foot on from time to time. So I'll ask her uh, next time I see her. Yeah. Other questions? This is nice, it's like, a, we kind of have like a small class here. We have uh, questions and you can get answers. It's almost, it's like college. Yes.
That's it. So the idea is maybe if you created an overarching identity, then it would flip from complementarity creates uh, liking and cohesion to like similarity does. That'd be interesting. That'd be very interesting, I think. Or another way you could maybe go with it is that maybe if you introduce an overarching identity or a common identity, it might increase mimicry or complementarity. You know, it might, or maybe that's what you were saying, but it might create the reverse causation of like high identification and cohesion induces these things that are highly associated with it, complementarity, mimicry. I don't know why they never did that. Did they never, yeah, they never did that. You'd think they would have done that at one of these points, said, okay, if all these things are so highly associated with identity and this common feeling that they cause it, you know, what about the reverse direction? You know, does identity induce higher rates of mimicry and complementarity on these kinds of behaviors that tend towards complementarity? One thing you might predict there is that a shared group identity that brings people together increases mimicry for behaviors that are mimicry, you know, that are the kind of behaviors that tend towards mimicry, but it doesn't create more complementarity uh, for, for these dominant submission things because um, a hierarchy is sort of inconsistent with shared identity. You know what I mean? Like when you have this shared identity, you think of yourselves as equals, as similar to one another. You don't think of one of you being better than the other. You know, it might even undermine the complementarity effect, maybe. All of these would be fantastic studies to do. Other, other questions? I feel like we're at Oberlin or something. We have like a 20 person class all of a sudden. This is fantastic. This is great. I see what they're always talking about. Um, <laughs> Okay, so, uh, all right, so some conclusions, some takeaways from this. People tend to mimic one another's nonverbal behavior. Um, those who tend towards empathy and perspective taking do this more. Uh, mimicry increases liking, comfort, cohesion, uh, and altruism, or, or at least giving behavior. Uh, behaviors that are associated with dominance, however, tend to create complementarity rather than mimicry. And for these behaviors, complementarity produces liking and comfort. So that's the end of the mimicry thing. And we'll move on to another, let's do something else. Let's talk about more automaticity stuff. Because we're not done, we're not satisfied, we've had some automaticity, but wouldn't it be nice to have more? The funny thing is it does feel a little bit like one of these Oberlin discussion sections or something they're always talking about with the little classes and all that that you've never, you've never none of you have ever experienced since high school or whatever. Uh, they, it feels like that, but there's like 300 of us here, you know? Uh, I think it's just a contrast effect. There's some kind of social psychology going on there. So. Okay, so I made this uh, additional presentation just because people tend to like this automaticity stuff and, and I really like this automaticity stuff. So uh, let's talk about more of this automaticity stuff. Um, okay, so more uh, research on supraliminal priming. Uh, what is the opposite of supraliminal priming? And what is supraliminal priming? That's way too long of a, that's a question requires too long of an answer to ask like this. Uh, somebody know what superliminal priming is? Anybody? Yes? That's right, but you're unaware of its effects, presumably. Presumably, yeah. So you're aware of the prime, unaware of its effects. Subliminal priming, unaware of the prime, also unaware of its effects. Okay, so here was another superliminal priming uh, study, also on tipping. Uh, for those of you who are servers, I'm doing my best to help you make gazillions of dollars. Uh, McCall and Belmont, 1996, 1996, studied the effects of credit card cues on tipping. And the idea was, do subtle reminders of credit, the fact that you have credit, or at least you did before this past fall, uh, <laughs> did, does it somehow make you spend your money more freely? Being reminded that, oh yeah, you can like spend money forever and you know, all you get is just a bunch of annoying phone calls. Uh, <laughs> so in two studies, studies one and two, they had servers deliver bills at restaurants, at a restaurant actually in Ithaca, New York, uh, which I can't figure out which one it is, even though I went to grad school there, I tried to figure it out, but they've protected the anonymity of this restaurant. They had servers deliver checks on trays and randomly manipulated whether the trays had pictures of credit cards on them which they tend now all to have following this research, uh, or didn't have pictures of credit cards on them. And the tipping percentages were as follows. Uh, in the first study, they found that people tend to tip 20% uh, as opposed to 16% or 15.5% when there's a little credit card insignia on the uh, tray that they got the bill on. Uh, in study two, the difference was 22% versus 17.5%. Uh, so that's interesting, right? People will tip more when they're subtly reminded of the fact that you can, you can spend infinite amounts of money. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, and this was interesting. You might expect that that effect would be driven by 
people tend to use credit cards when they're reminded of the credit card. Do you know what I mean? Like, that maybe in this condition and in this condition, the reason that they're tipping more is because they're using their credit card. And people tend to maybe tip more when they use their credit card because they don't have to actually hold the money they're giving away. They just have to write the number down. You know what I'm saying? Like, maybe people just spend more freely with a credit card. What's that? Right, yeah, exactly. I think people are probably more generous when they don't have to actually pick up money and give it to somebody. <laughs> Gotta be true, yeah. But they actually found this effect happen regardless of whether people used, the credit, used a credit card uh, or not. So it was the case that priming people with credit card insignias, uh, it may, I don't remember if it led to greater credit card use, but even taking that into account, it was the case that it made people tip more because it kind of reminded them that they have money to burn, I guess. Okay. This is uh, a crazy study which, if you're anything like the past classes I've taught, you probably won't believe anything that follows. Uh, but, I, and I don't know if I do either, I don't know. Okay, so uh, this guy Brett Pelham, or Pelham, or Pelham, I don't know, uh, and, and colleagues in 2002 uh, did a study that shocked the world. And indeed, it didn't make it into Gladwell's, I know, I know, that's why you've already heard of it. Uh, and it, it didn't make it into Gladwell's blink, I don't believe, and I think it's partly because people struggle to believe it, uh, even though I think there's some pretty good reason to believe it. So prepare to have your world rocked. Uh, whew, man, I'm ready. I don't know about you, you're probably not ready. Maybe we'll do it, we'll do it next week. No, let's do it, okay, we're ready, we're ready. Okay, I don't wanna say that. okay, we'll do it. Okay, so the title of the paper is Why Susie Sells Seashells by the Seashore. Yeah, that's not easy, okay. Um, and the idea is to test this idea of implicit egotism. And implicit egotism is an idea, anytime I define something, you want to attach significance to that. Uh, implicit egotism is the idea that people have generally positive impressions of themselves. And uh, this is not new, right? We already knew about this. From motivated reasoning, the above average effect, uh, you know, the, these sorts of processes, motivated recall, all, all of these phenomena we talked about earlier in the class when we were talking about cognitive biases, this, this is just another one of those. Another one of those uh, self-serving biases where we tend to think we're really, really awesome in excess of what other people think of us. <laughs> so, uh, implicit egotism, right, okay, it's an example of a self-serving bias. And one of the effects of this, and we talked about this already, uh, is that people tend to like the initials in their names and the letters of their name more than other letters in the alphabet. This is this strong, relatively strong tendency and uh, I only picked one example from the crowd here, but he, indeed, his favorite letter was S, and your first name is? Yep, okay. So, it's true. <laughs> that means it's true. Uh, because we have one case. Actually, we have lots of cases of this. So we have, we have good evidence that this is a robust effect, and Spencer is not unusual. Um, well, he's unusual in other ways. He's an individual, and that, that's important to him. Okay, so how far can this effect be taken? Um, how far can this implicit egotism effect be taken? Is it just the case that it makes you go, oh yeah, my favorite letter, you know, in my case is R or W, those are my two favorite letters. Is that all it does or is it, could it maybe direct behaviors, maybe even significant behaviors in your life? And that was the idea behind this. Uh, maybe, maybe Susie sells seashells by the seashore because she loves the letter S. And that's the joke in the title. I know, it's a ridiculous title. So. In study one, they went and they found the most common male and female names that share the first three letters with one of the top 40 population cities in the United States. So they took the list of the top 40 population cities in the United States, they went through the social security database and found uh, the most common male and female names that have the same first three letters. So some examples are Jack and Jacksonville, uh, Philip and Philadelphia. They made a bunch of pairs like this where they're like, okay, these, these names sound a lot like the uh, you know, these major populous cities. Mildred, Milwaukee, uh, Virginia, Virginia Beach, and so on. And then they analyzed the frequency of these people appearing in these cities, and they found that people were disproportionately likely to live in cities that resembled their first name. Okay, that's study one. Okay, study two. They looked at the eight most populous states in America. And they found that people with the same first few letters in their last name were disproportionately likely to live in these states. Uh, so, I don't know, what's an example of that? Uh, yeah, like people, um, uh, what would be an example? Why is this hard to do? I can't think of why. Yeah, yeah, California, it'd have to be the first three though, right? 
first few. I don't know what that means. Probably three. Yeah. Is that, is that surprising now? That's not surprising. <laughs> I would have expected that. And indeed, all of your last names start with C-A-L. So the, uh, um, I don't know how we'd ever noticed that. How did we never notice that before? <laughs> OK, study three. They took the eight largest uh, cities in Canada, and they found the same effect again. And again, they used last names. Because they were like, well, maybe they stopped using first names. Why did they stop using first names? Right, naming trends change. Yes? Right. Maybe the causality is a different, the opposite direction. It isn't the case that you tend to move to California because your name is Callahan, but instead, uh, you know, your name Jack because you were born in Jacksonville and your parents were influenced by that or just love Jacksonville so much they want to celebrate it with the name of their firstborn child. <laughs> So they switched to last names, and that was a good idea, right? Because critics would be like, yeah, people name their kids after the towns they're born in. Big, big friggin' deal. Um, and, uh, and so they found the same effect using last names, again, for the eight most populous states in the U.S. and the eight largest cities in Canada. Uh, in study four, they looked at Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, and Virginia, and Kentucky. Uh, why did they look at these? Because there's people, there's very common similar first names uh, that correspond with all of those, like Flo and Georgia and Louis and Virginia. Y'all know a Flo. Don't, don't, don't act like you don't. And uh, I don't know what the one is for Kentucky. Uh, oh, Kenny or Kenneth. Right, yeah, okay. So, uh, and they found that people with similar first names were unusually likely to live in that state, and they found it for both men and women. So Louise and Louise are both, you know, disproportionately likely to live in Louisiana. Uh, Kenneth's in Kentucky, Florence is in Florida, uh, Virginia's in Virginia, et cetera. Um, but again, they're back to first names now, so it's susceptible to that critique that people that are born in Virginia are just disproportionately likely to be named Virginia. Uh, they did not find an effect for Virgils in Virginia. I think it was honest of them to point that out. They could have buried that effect, but they told us this somehow does not apply to Virgils. I should clarify that for all of these, these are tiny, tiny, tiny effects. Tiny effects that you would need to use the entire social security database, the entire list of people who live in Virginia in order to find these effects. Very small biasing effects. Okay, study five. They looked at all U.S. cities that start with Saint something. So like St. Paul, St. Louis, you know, in Missouri and whatever, St. Louis, whatever, uh, you know, all these St. places. I don't know, what's another one of these? St. St. Paul, I said that one. St. Helena, is that a place? I made that up. <laughs> is that, the, yeah. Mount St. Helens. But nobody lives there. It's a volcano. All right, well, anyway, there's these places. They start with saint, and then they have a name. And they're, they're good examples, right? Because they have you know, saint, then a name. So obviously, people, somebody must have that name. And so um, they looked at whether people were disproportionately likely to live in towns that resemble their names. So, and yes, people with the name, the same name as the town, were disproportionately likely to live in cities with that name. Also, I like this one, people with saint in their name were disproportionately likely to live in cities uh, that have the saint, the same thing. So if your name is like Jill St. John, for example, the 70s actress, or something. who's Jill St. John, or is she, is she like a, who is Jill St. John? Somebody knows this. Okay, all right, all right, all right, somebody look this up. Okay, Jill St. John, for example, you know, probably lives in St. Paul, Minnesota. Yes? Santa. Right, 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 like Santa Clara or something like that. Yeah, San Jose. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know if they did those. Yeah. Good question. Um, okay, study six, they looked at birthdays. They found that people have positive associations with the numbers in their birthday, you know? Um, and I think this is true. I have a really positive association. Like, my birthday is 7677. I just, I just volunteered for identity theft just then, and uh, that was a big mistake. Uh, and I was like one uh, month from being, or one, sorry, one hour from being born on 7777, the luckiest day of the last century to be born, which I just missed. But I totally, seven's like my number. It's grand, it's like the lucky number, but I still, it's, uh, I like that number. I totally admit that I like that number. And so what they're interested in is do people who have uh, birthdays like mine, where a number is repeated multiple times, like people who were born on February 2nd or May 5th, uh, are they unusually likely to live in towns that have the number in the name, like Two Harbors, Minnesota, or Five Points, Alabama? And uh, they found, yes, yes. 
Yes, they were. <laughs> um, and not like a huge effect. There's like a small one, a small one. Okay. Uh, study said, this is not done yet. This is the most famous study. Uh, study seven, they looked at the most common male and female names that resembled uh, lawyer or dentist. And uh, so for women, that'd be like Denise, Dina, I don't know that name, Denise, spelled differently, Dena, Laura, Lauren, Lori, Laverne, men, Dennis, 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 and Dennis, <laughs> and Lawrence, Larry, and Lawrence, and Lawrence. Uh, so, uh, and the results were <laughs> that the men, uh, were disproportionately likely to do the job that resembled their names. So Dennis's are more likely to be dentists than our Lawrence's, and Lawrence's are more likely to be lawyers than our Dennis's. Does that make sense? And, and Denise's, I know, Denise's are more likely to be Dennis than, than uh, uh, Laverne's, and then Laverne's are more likely than Denise's. Um, though these are very small effects. I should, all of these effects are really, really small, but statistically significant. Um, Study eight, they looked at George's and Jeffrey's and they found they were disproportionately likely to publish articles in the geosciences, <laughs> which is so weird. <laughs> I guess their argument here is George's and Jeffrey's are unusually likely to go into the geosciences, like geography or what have you, uh, or geology. And uh, that's weird. So also, this one's really, really weird. People with the first or last name starting with H or R were disproportionately likely to have hardware stores but not roofing companies, and then R's, not H's, were un, you know, disproportionately likely to start roofing companies, but not hardware stores. Um, so if your name starts with an R, you're unusually likely to become a roofer and maybe start a roofing store, and then, or sell roofies, or you know, whatever. And then if, you're, if your name starts with an H, if your name starts, that was bad, I shouldn't have done that. When your name starts with an H, then you're unusually likely to be in hardware. So, uh, right, okay. Okay, the likelihood of naming your hardware or roofing company with an H, for example, Honolulu Hardware, or, and not, not, not your name, not like Harry's Hardware, like Honolulu Hardware, or, you know, um, I, don't, I don't know, Repossession Roofing, or something like that, <laughs> was uh, unusually likely if your first name started with an H or an R or whatever. Yeah, you, got the, you get the idea. Okay, okay. All right, so, conclusions. Implicit egotism uh, uh, effects receive support from all these studies. I mean, this is a lot of studies, right? A lot of converging evidence. Um, uh, they also conducted some experiments that converge with these findings. Like they would show you like clips of like football plays, and then they would manipulate whether the person's number was your birthday or not. And then you would say that you liked, you know, your favorite player on the team was like more likely, to, I'm not making sense, but uh, so they showed you, they somehow manipulated whether the football player in, the, in some clip you're being shown, and they controlled for everything else, whether his number resembles your birthday or doesn't, and then you liked him more and thought he was like a better football player if, if his number was your birthday, um, which is weird and interesting. Uh, but I don't know about you, but this is still very hard to accept. Um, and one of the big things here is how many effects did they look for, not find, and then not put in the paper, right? Because if they were running, say, 100 analysis, or say they were running, they're, they're using a 0.05 significance level, which, is mean, which means that the, the effect is considered statistically significant if, it, if, it's, if, if, there's, uh, if statistical analyses tell us that there's a 95% probability that it's true. Uh, so that means that what they could have done is there's no real effect at all. They ran 20 times as many analyses and then just presented the 5% that passed that threshold. And that'd be our concern, is they ran, you know, they ran 200 analyses that were all plausible, found 10, you know, 1 20th of them, and published those in a paper, and it looks really convincing, you know, 10 straight t studies with no exceptions. But maybe it's the case, can you all be quiet over there? Thank you. Uh, maybe it was the case that they ran 190 other effects that they didn't get, in which case uh, uh, we w we w it would just be uh, totally bogus. There's no real finding. So what do you think? What do, you, do you think it's real or do you think it's not? Raise your hand if you think it's real. I'm like, Ugh, I don't know, yes. Okay, what do, you, what do you, you think it's not? Okay, all right, all right, very interesting, okay. All right, so, uh, one last one, then we'll take a break. Uh, the first instinct fallacy, somebody asked a few days ago, does the apartment buying study suggest that snap decisions, or does all this automaticity research, what does it say about snap decisions, and whether you should go with your first instinct uh, on like a multiple choice test or your later instincts. A question, a research question, very close to all of your hearts as you take all these multiple choice tests all the friggin' time. So, 
People generally think that you're supposed to go with your first instinct, right? This is kind of the advice that you get, right? Like on a multiple choice test, you know, they're like, go with your first instinct. You know, if all else is equal and you don't know which one's right, you got two options, go with your first instinct. And actually, even GRE prep books, you know, Kaplan books and stuff, tend to say this. They say, you know, you know, common wisdom suggests you're supposed to go with your first instinct. But did they ever really systematically study it? Uh, I don't think so, based on the results of this research. And one of the ideas behind this research on the first instinct fallacy is that just because autom automatic thinking is fast and for some tasks is very effective, uh, you know, like the, um, like thin slices, it's pretty effective. Just because it can be fast and surprisingly effective doesn't necessarily mean that your first instinct is right or is your best answer. Remember the apartment buying uh, uh, study where they showed that actually having three minutes to do further non-conscious thought works a lot better than a first instinct snap decision. Yes? Really? Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Okay, so the Princeton Review maybe doesn't make the same mistake that Kaplan does of teaching people to do the first instinct fallacy. But regardless of how much, you know, I don't know how they would rig a test to like go against your first instincts. I, I don't know, I guess. They use middle schoolers as a way to test what your first instincts are. I like that, that's great. <laughs> Your first instinct is that of a child. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's pretty funny. <laughs> I like that. That's good. Automatically, we're tiny children. It's with great effort that we pretend to be adults. I like that. I like that. That's good. I'm not. That might hold up to scrutiny. Actually, I think that's right. Okay. 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 So let's see what this evidence is for the first instinct fallacy. So if two answers seem correct, equally correct to you, which one should you go with? So in study one. Uh, this, this research was conducted at University of Illinois by Justin Kruger and some, I think, and colleagues, or just Justin Kruger? Uh, I didn't say. Okay, I think just Justin Kruger. And Justin Kruger, he looked at 1,561 multiple choice exams, took those, what do you call those things? The things? Scantrons, thank you. And uh, from a Psych 101 class, University of Illinois, that had like 500 people take three exams. And uh, so he got 1,561 exams. And he looked at changed answers, because you can see the eraser marks. Now, wouldn't you like to be his undergraduate research assistant and go through 1,561 exams coding where the eraser marks are? That's rough. And he looked at, you know, in how many cases is there an answer and a clearly erased answer, no other erased answers, the person, uh, you know, had it down to two and went with one and had briefly gone with the other at some point and looked at the rate of the following combinations. How many times do they have the wrong answer and then they switch to the right one? Uh, so they have the wrong answer and then switch to the right one 51% of the time. Uh, how many times did they have the right answer and then switch to the wrong one? That was 25% of the time. And then how many times did they have the wrong one and switch to another wrong one? <laughs> that was pretty unfortunately often. Um, so here, you know, there's a frequency finding here that there was a bigger tendency for people to go from wrong to right to improve when they switched than to get worse when they switched. And this is not tight, perfect evidence or anything, but it's interesting. I mean, there's a lot of people who had first and second instincts and never, you know, put anything down. We don't know about them yet, but this is some interesting initial evidence. Also, remember that people tend to think that you should go with your first instincts. And so he had students from the class predict what the results of the study would be. And they were about right about the wrong to wrong rate, you know, they almost got this exactly right. But in terms of the ratio of, of switching from wrong to right, uh, versus switching from right to wrong, they thought it was the exact opposite direction. They thought that in general when people switch, they switch from right to wrong, i.e. they shouldn't switch, right? They should stick with their first answer. Uh, and they thought less often is the switch from wrong to right, uh, an improving switch. So people thought that was unusual. They believed your first instincts were better. And then, at least in this, these data, they were wrong. Do you understand? Okay. So, okay, so that's some initial evidence. Study two. Why would people have the first instinct fallacy? Why the heck would this even be the case? And their argument is, perhaps it's somehow more painful to have the right answer and switch to a wrong one than have the wrong answer and not switch. Wait, what? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Damn. Okay, well, I guess, yeah. Right, right, okay. All right, yes, if you're gonna, oh, sorry. Uh, if you're gonna have, <laughs> yes, okay. If you're gonna mess up, it's much more painful to have had the right answer 
and, uh, yeah, and, and then get it wrong by switching, then stick with the right answer and get it wrong, you know? So it may be the case that you somehow over-remember uh, wrong switching and under-remember wrong staying. So I know that's weird. Okay. So maybe it's the case that because it's so painful to have had the right answer and then switch to something else, you, you attach great significance to it mentally. Whereas sticking with your first instinct and getting it wrong, you know, that's painful as well, but not as painful. Because you don't say, oh, I almost had it, but then I lost it. And their logic here is, uh, is counterfactuals, that you generate a counterfactual. What's a counterfactual? It's a, uh, a what-if scenario that you entertain in your head, uh, where you say, oh, I could have maybe gotten it right, but I, but I switched. And so going from wrong, uh, sorry, going from right to wrong, from the right answer to the wrong answer, generates this counterfactual of like, I could have got it right, but I screwed up. With, this is very familiar to you, right? Like you, you experience this. When you have the right answer and you switch out of it, it's a horrible feeling. And it may be a worse feeling than two or three sticking with the right, uh, wrong answer uh, situations. Counterfactuals, uh, this, this tendency for counterfactuals, what if scenarios, oh, I could have done better, oh, I could have gotten it right. It's such a strong tendency in humans that it can, it can mess up our reasoning in lots of domains. There's a really famous study showing, uh, well, let me ask you this. Uh, of gold, silver, and bronze medalists in the Olympics, when they called them and surveyed them about how happy they were, with their performance. What do you think the ranking is? Right, exactly. It goes gold, bronze, silver, which is interesting, right? The silver medalists finished better than the bronze, but the silver medalists generate counterfactuals of like, I could have finished first. For the rest of their lives, they're like, I didn't get the gold. You know, I finished second. They feel less happy with their performance than people who got the bronze because they're generating counterfactuals like, oh, I could have not placed at all. I could have gotten no medal at all. So you get this ironic thing where bronze medalists are happier than silver medalists, um, which wouldn't seem to make sense, but it totally makes sense if you understand the human mind at all. So, so we over-remember wrong switching and under-remember wrong staying, uh, even though switching is actually good in general, which I haven't really finished making the case for that yet, so you should still be suspicious. This is a picture of somebody taking a test a long time ago. <laughs> I don't know. Anything to just kind of fill the screen. Okay, so in study two, they asked students which would feel worse, and they overwhelmingly reported switching when they should have stuck with the right answer over sticking with the right answer when they should have switched. Uh, so when they asked them, you know, which one would make you feel worse, they say yes, having the right answer and switching away from it, that feels worse than anything else. But then the question is, it's not just feeling worse, it's gotta be over-remembered somehow, right? Because you need to be generating this fallacy in your head that you're supposed to stick with uh, your first instinct. And it isn't necessarily the case that just because it's more painful not to do that, that you'll de develop that fallacious uh, belief. It's got to be the case that you over-remember these cases where you switch from the right answer and think that they happened all the time and were really frequent, and then you j develop this, this theory that you, you, know, you shouldn't switch, that you should stick with your first instinct. So is it the case that people really do over-remember switching away from a right answer to a wrong one? So they gave participants part of an SAT and asked them to indicate two answers that they narrowed, uh, that they narrowed down to, like, and which one was the first instinct when they didn't uh, immediately know the answer. So they give them an SAT, and then they say, okay, now for these ones where you get down to two answers, clearly indicate it, and then give your best guess. And uh, yeah, uh, so then they were told the correct answers afterwards, and they were given time to like, go back through these questions and say, oh, okay, for this one I got down to two, I went with this one, it was, my, it was my first instinct, I got it right. This one's my second instinct, I got it wrong, you know. And they're able to like kind of rehearse this and get full feedback on what happened. Um, and then they're contacted four to six, six weeks later. They're told how many they narrowed down to. They say, okay, you narrowed, you know, you just took the SAT with us like four weeks ago. You narrowed 15 questions down to two answers. For those, uh, how many were cases where you stayed with the first one and got it right? How many were cases where you stayed with the first instinct and got it wrong? How many were ones where you went with your second instinct and got it right? How many were ones where you went with your second instinct and got it wrong? What's their hypothesis? That they're going to overestimate how many times they stuck with their first instinct and got it wrong. Because that's specifically really painful and you tend to over-remember it. And Okay, well, one thing is when they actually took the test, they tended to stick with their right a the, the first answer more than switching, which was wrong because if they'd actually, they actually missed more from sticking than switching. Uh, 
But the main finding is the memory bias. Participants tended to over-remember how many times they had switched and got the question wrong relative to how many times they really did, and they tended to under-remember how many times they had stayed with their right answer and got it wrong. So they tended to under-remember how bad going with your first instinct can be. Um, so overall, they should have gone with their first instinct, or sorry, they should have gone with their later instinct. They didn't. They tended to go with their first instinct, but then they misremembered what had happened. And actually, even though they were given full information, they misremembered what had happened and tended to remember the opposite had happened. You know? Okay. So that's where we get this dumb theory that you should go with your first instinct. Despite evidence, full evidence to the contrary, we'll tend to remember uh, that we should have stuck with our first answer even when that wasn't the case. So the conclusion from this research, trust your later instincts, further thinking, be it conscious or unconscious, in this case conscious, in the apartment buying study unconscious, is typically better than snap decision making. Remember it's the case that those thin slice judgments of what the teacher's evaluations would be like at the end of the semester, they were, you know, not terribly off. You know, they were correlated with the final answer, but they didn't get it perfectly right. You do get more information on your environment, on a test, on what the right answer is, on an apartment buying scenario or some kind of choice situation. You do get more information when you think longer, be it consciously or unconsciously, and you do tend to make a better decision given a little bit of time. So, s some final thoughts on automaticity. Um, automaticity research points to the sometimes amazing strength of non-conscious factors on behavior. Uh, however, it does not mean that we should believe in any sort of magical data finding, you know? Uh, I think a lot of people went from this to, wait, maybe all that stuff about ESP is right, you know? Because you can be non-consciously suggested and influenced with uh, stimuli that you wouldn't think would cause these effects. So maybe it's the case that things like ESP, telepathy, and so on are now plausible. Maybe they're all, maybe all of that is true, just like we always kind of suspected. But, uh, but no. Uh, and when you're, uh, there's no reason to that this, any of this directly implies that despite what some people have taken from it. And uh, when using a scientific approach, you should always look for strong empirical evidence. Uh, and the scientific approach involves skepticism regarding claims. And if you read these papers, you'll see they run three, four, five studies. They run like nine studies sometimes. They say, oh, you might be critical of the fact that we're using first names and the causal direction might be the opposite. So we ran this study to address that. Oh, you might think that actually people felt comfort and liking, and that made them adopt the complementary body posture. So we rigged complementary body posture and showed comfort and liking comes after that. They go and they address these alternative explanations that are, that are uh, advanced, that they advance themselves in criticism of their own work. They bend over backwards to prove themselves wrong, in Richard Feynman's words, and that's how they do good convincing science. What wouldn't be good convincing science is to take some slipshod evidence and say it's evidence for extrasensory perception or something like that and try and get people to buy it. So scientists are expected to be self-critical and this is a central part of the scientific method is relentless scrutiny of the conclusions you're making. And if you do this, when you do science, you'll be more convincing because you'll disarm your critics. Your critics will say, oh, I never even thought of that criticism of your research. You know, wow, you're, you're, you're doing self-criticism even in excess of my criticisms. And so that's, that's the one way to do science that's particularly attractive uh, to an audience. So that's the end of this one. We'll just we'll end this one a little bit early, and uh, see you back on Tuesday.